Well, good morning again. So in today's scripture that John read for us, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing about the past, the present, and the future. Where he's been, where he is, and where he's going, what he sees ahead. And Paul's not only talking about himself, he's not only talking to the first century disciples, but he's also inviting us to examine our past, our present, and our future as well. Verse 12, Paul is talking about the present when he says, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So right out of the gate in that very first passage, Paul is telling us that he knows that he has still much work to do in this life, that he has not yet achieved the goal. Some translations will use here, instead of goal, that he's going on to perfection. That's a, a Wesleyan term from John Wesley, uh, our, our founder of the Methodist movement, that he is becoming better, still striving for. So don't get confused, um, as some folks do, when they hear the word perfect, because we are just striving towards that goal, continuing to make ourselves better through the help of Christ. Because Paul continues then that that he's imperfect now in the present, even as he's penning this letter from a jail cell in Rome. And even as that imperfection, uh, he still continues on. And jumping ahead in the passage, he writes, Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. Paul's encouraging us, encouraging the disciples, each of us, to, to look at him that his life is a living testimony, saying, look at me, look at my character as imperfect as I am, and even as imperfect as I once was, keep your eyes on Jesus like I have and live according to God. Because he continues then to offer himself as this living example, glorifying God because people are are being tempted, they're being distracted, pulled away from the goal that goal that is the salvation in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's pretty shocking, right, that, that people are more concerned with worldly pleasures back in the day 2,000 years ago as we are just today, who Paul calls enemies of the cross, enemies of the cross. And he continues to, to get quite tough here in his letter, writes that they are headed for destruction, these enemies of the cross, because he's using this illusion where, where uh, Jesus says to Take up your cross and follow me, a cross that calls for for sacrifice, for for giving up those worldly things, instead following the principles and commands of God. Paul writes that their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Paul's basically saying that they've become slaves to pride, the sin of of pride, the, the me, myself, and I syndrome of the here and the now, the I am the center of my own universe, that I am the only one that matters. Whatever we call it, whatever Paul calls it, he still calls it a sin. A sin that we all can fall trapped to, and I'm willing to bet that we've all fallen trapped to. Paul himself and Pastor Chris, myself as well. And then Paul continues on. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Stop looking in the rearview mirror is what Paul is saying to us. That stuff's behind you. It's in the past. And Paul himself has a good reason to stop focusing on the past, to stop staring in the rear view mirror. He remembers, and we know because we have scripture, we've read the Bible, we know that Paul was once Saul. Saul stood there holding the coats of the religious zealots, those that he ignited with fury, standing there watching as they stoned Stephen to death. Stephen being the first Christian martyr murdered for his love of Christ. And Paul stood there and watched. And that wasn't enough for Saul because he couldn't comprehend at this time 
the love of Christ. He didn't understand why so many Jews were abandoning the roots of their faith and following this Jesus who was now dead. And he couldn't understand that Jesus was God, that he had come to show people how to love and to proclaim God's kingdom. And Saul just didn't get it. So instead, he decided to persecute Christians, those who did understand, causing many to to flee from their homes because now they were labeled as enemies of the cross, as Paul ironically writes, inciting fear into many, leaving behind their belongings, their way of life, having them imprisoned and tortured and, of course, worse. That's what was in Paul's rearview mirror. He's well aware of what's in his past. Paul had much to be ashamed about. I would be willing to bet that he carried along with him a good amount of guilt for all the destruction and hurt and death that he caused. And as we sit here today, we know all too well that we have a lot in common with Paul. We might have something or some things, many things that have caused great hurt to others and even to ourselves. As followers of Jesus, we, we live in this tension of the present, of, of knowing where we've come from, that tension of knowing what's in our past and what we have done, but also what God is calling us to, where God desires us to be. As he reminds us, proclaiming that our ultimate citizenship isn't of this earth, isn't of the United States of America, but is instead as a citizen of heaven. We are named, we are claimed as a child of God, that by accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we are welcomed into God's heavenly home, that this body of humiliation that Paul writes, this lifetime of transgressions, of sins, can and will be and shall be washed white as wool in the blood of Jesus. That's the tension that we live in, the past with the future, but also in the present, knowing that we continue to sin and that we can't help but get out of our own way, that we can't help but continue to to look in that rearview mirror and say, yeah, but Pastor Chris, I know what I did. So in that, too often we continue to punish ourselves for past mistakes as if we could make up for all those wrongs that we've done. We feel this way because inherently we know the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, or or good and evil. We know that. We know what we should do, and yet we don't. That's from Paul as well. We continue to sin even though we know better. And hypothetically, if we reflect upon our lives, this isn't how God's salvation works out, but if we were to list Everything on this side, all the good things that we've done. And that list might run far down the aisle here and out on the Pennsylvania Avenue. And on this side, if we make a list of all the bad things we've done, I hope and pray that that list is shorter. But we could look at this very long list and remember for a brief moment all the great things that we've done. All the things that we've made our loved ones happy and hopeful and and joyful and made God smile. But then over here on this shorter list of the bad things... Those bad things, those sins, those mistakes, those transgressions are the things that we focus so much on. Those things that that hold our minds hostage, that overwhelm us, that consume us, that take up that mental energy that holds us in bondage as a prisoner. And then we attempt to make it better, right? We walk through each day telling ourselves that we are less than, that we're unworthy, that we're losers, that we're failures, that we're screw-ups. We mentally whip ourselves, trying to, to make it right for the mistakes that we've made. We convince ourselves that we're just no good. We continue to, to live as a prisoner chained to that past, a prisoner to ourselves and the things that we can still see behind us. We fail to let go to even forgive ourselves, even if we've already asked Jesus to forgive us. And he has forgiven us, and yet we can't forgive ourselves. We hold on to those hurts and those grudges that we've inflicted upon others and even upon ourselves. 
And even though no one else may know that secret pain that we harbor and those negative emotions that we feel, it continues to gnaw at us day after day, gnawing at our joy, gnawing at our satisfaction in life. It holds us back from living that life that God desires for us, failing to live that life that God offers for us. As you're hearing this, it probably comes as no surprise that psychological counselors report that the hardest person to forgive is hardest to forgive yourself, right? It's not the the friend who backstabbed you. It's not the mom or the dad that wasn't there for you. It wasn't the ex that broke your heart. It wasn't even the employer that fired you. It's you. It's me. It's I. It's ourselves. The hardest person to forgive. Why is that? Because we know ourselves. We live with ourselves every single day. And we're told, forgive yourself. Just forgive yourself. It's easy to say, right? But it's hard to do. We all mess up sometimes. We all sin. I'm sure as I've been going on here for these past few minutes that we're all thinking of something. Something we've been holding on to. Some sin it might be large, it might be small. It's a sin nevertheless. It might be something as lashing out at a friend or overreacting against a family member. Maybe it's engaging in some sort of self-destructive or addictive behavior. Maybe it's something like cutting corners at work. Maybe something that we can't even feel that we are worthy to bring into the light because we are so ashamed of it. But we know it. We know We've screwed up. We know we sinned. And with our sin comes those negative feelings, so long as we aren't a sociopath. <laughs> comes with those negative, I had to make you laugh a little bit during this. <laughs> those feelings of, of shame, of guilt, right? Embarrassment, humiliation, self-condemnation. Those feelings that that grab a hold of us and they just won't let go. We won't let it go. But I'm here to remind you, to tell you, that Paul tells you, that God tells you, that I hope you've heard it before, but I know we need to hear it again because I am a pastor and I hear what you say. Move on. Move on from the past. Forgive yourself. Allow yourself to be forgiven because God has forgiven you. Let the past be the past. Stop focusing on that rearview mirror and looking behind you. You can remember it for sure. God certainly wants you to learn from it, but God doesn't want you to be a prisoner of it. God wants you to live in the present, learning from your past, but also keeping eyes to the future and looking what God has ahead for you. Stop beating yourself up of what happened last month or last year or five or ten years ago or maybe even longer. God wants you to accept who you are, accept who we are as a child of God, forgiven and reconciled because of what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. Not because of what we have done for ourselves, not just because we try harder, but because of what Christ has accomplished for us on that cross. And when Jesus was nailed to that tree, when he died for us, he knew how bad we are. He knew how bad we were. And he knew how bad we will continue to be. And even in in spite of all that, in spite of all our sin, in spite of what we're holding on to even here this morning, he proved his love for us, for you, for every single person sitting here in this sanctuary, for every single person tuning in on the live stream. He proved to us that much of his love that he offered us a way through him to God, a way for our sin to be washed free, a way to be reconciled to the Father, a way for us to be free of that bondage that holds us back to release those chains of guilt and shame, self-hatred that control our thoughts and our behaviors. As Paul reminds us, our citizenship is in heaven. 
It has been offered to us, bought and paid for once and for all by Jesus Christ. And God offered his grace for us, not so that we can reject it because we feel unworthy, but to accept God's grace because God says you are worthy. You are worthy. God's son didn't die on the cross in vain, but God died for you and for me to offer us a way home. I'm gonna end this, this morning with a, a short story, a legend, if you will. Um, I found it online about four days ago. Two thirds of it I found online and the other, the last third of it, I kind of uh, retrofitted it uh, to, to fit today's sermon. So it's sort of original, sort of not. It's a legend of about four days old. So you can share this as you go out to, to perpetuate the legend. But it goes like this. It was three men, or to be all inclusive, we can say, or three women. Um, they each had backpacks. And what I realized, um, they have two backpacks, one on the front and one on the back. Is it really a backpack if it's on your chest? Maybe a satchel, right? Maybe a sack, maybe a man purse or a woman purse. I don't know. But nevertheless, they had two, two sacks that carried things, one on their front across their chest and one on their back. And the first man was asked, what are in your bags? What's in your backpack? What's across your chest bag? Well, on my back, he says, I carry all of the good things, all the good things that my friends and family have done. I'm proud of them, but they are their accomplishments, and I just keep them handy. Across my chest, though, I carry all the bad things that I have done. They're constantly there. They're, they're kind of in my face. And every now and then I stop and I open up this pack that's on my chest. I, I take things out. I examine them. I think about them and all the wrong that I have done. And then I put them back in and strap them back across my chest. And this guy, this first guy, he admitted that he doesn't get far in life because these bad things, the wrongs that he's done, are constantly in his face. And he stops quite frequently to, to examine those things, but just puts them right back in. He hasn't gone far along his journey. The second man was asked the same question, what's in his chest pack and what's in his backpack? And he replied, well, in the front sack are, are all the good things that I've done. I like to see them, I like to see them so often that I take them out and look at them and I'm proud of them, so I show everybody, I tell everybody all the great things that have been done to me and that I have done. The bag on my back, though, that's where I keep all of my mistakes, my transgressions, my sins, the wrongs are all on my back. I carry all of them all of the time. Sure, they're quite heavy, but thankfully they're on my back. And because of their heaviness, and because I never get rid of them, they do slow me down. But just for whatever reason, I just can't get rid of them. He also admitted, because of the heaviness on his back, he doesn't get quite far along in his journey. Then the third man, again, was asked the same question. What's in your bags? He said, oh, the, the sack in my front, that's great. That's where I keep all my prayers. That's where I keep all the positive thoughts, the hopes, the joys that I have for my loved ones, my family, my friends. That's also where I keep all of the memories of God's blessings that he has given to me. The great things in my life, those things that I am thankful for, they are across my chest. And yes, that bag is quite full, but it's not that heavy. In fact, it is full, but it acts more like the sail of a ship and keeps me going forward. The bag on my back, like the other guy, that's where I put all of my stakes, my mistakes, the things that I've done wrong, the hurt that I've caused intentionally or accidentally. Those sins that I've done, they go on my back. And that bag would be quite heavy. It definitely would weigh me down, but it doesn't because now it's empty. That bag is empty. There's nothing in it. You see, when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, God cut a hole in the bottom of my bag. I still mess up. I still sin, and I know it. So I take those sins, and I put them in my bag, asking God each time to forgive me. I've even mended that bag. I sewed that hole back up because I didn't feel worthy. But each time that I sin and I ask God for forgiveness, I put that sin in my backpack, God's mercy appears and so does that hole, allowing the sin to fall out and stay behind me in the past. Yes, as I walk ahead on my journey, I do look back from time to time and I see how far I've come now because that bag is not weighing me down. I learn from those mistakes. I still see those sins that I've done in my past, but they are not weighing me down. I thank God for 
for my guidance, for his guidance. And that, thank God for that hole in my bag so I can see how far I've come and how much closer I am along my journey and closer to that goal. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray with me? Gracious God, we, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We just want to say thank you so much for, for showing us what your love look like, what looks like. We ask for forgiveness for all those times that, that we've <clears throat> messed up in our lives, for those sins that we continue to carry with us. But God, through your Son, even those times that we've said that we are unworthy, we've rejected forgiveness because we believe that we are not worthy. Your son still says, yes, you are, I am, we are worthy. God, there is so much that that each of us are holding on to here this morning. You know what lies on our hearts. So we are gonna take a moment or two to pray to you, to ask you for forgiveness, for your mercy, for your grace, to, to shower upon us for those things that we've been holding on to way too long. while we were sinners, God, you sent your, your one and only Son to us to live, to teach us how to love, and to die for us. In that, you proved your love for us, for us as sinners, that we are welcome as a citizen of heaven. God, we thank you for, for your mercy and your forgiveness. All this we thank in Jesus Christ's holy name, our Lord and our Savior. And all his children said, amen. I invite you to now rise as you are able as we continue along with our worship.